what it is what's going on everybody welcome to the first ones to die today we're in for a yet another awesome episode they were gonna wait 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 jerome what are you doing well i, I just i just figured i always do this you know, just... okay okay you ain't even in this episode you know what we'll see you next week all right <laughs> let me take this over bye you know if you want to do it that's the <clears throat> what it is Hey everyone, it's Jonathan here, and we have a very special episode for you today. We're talking all about mental health depictions in media, film, TV, and all of that good stuff. We also have a very special guest on the podcast today, and it is the Kyle Moore of the Life Direct podcast. Now, you guys are in for a great conversation. I think you'll really enjoy our discussion, and Kyle was so, so, so great to talk to uh, now, fair warning, look, we're all in this new post-pandemic, all digital age, so technical difficulties happen, so our introduction with Kyle did get cut off a little bit, but I'll summarize for you all. So basically, anyone who's listened to this podcast for more than an episode knows that I am a huge, 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 huge Big Brother fan. And a couple of weeks ago, Big Brother Canada released the cast for their current season. One of the cast members had a very problematic past, so they replaced him immediately with someone named Kyle Moore. Big Brother fans found this Kyle Moore, the one that we have on our episode today, and thought it was him. So they started up, they started blowing up his social media, found his uh, mental health podcast and we're like we like this guy we we like this Kyle Moore turns out it was the wrong Canadian Kyle Moore but regardless the big brother community have embraced this original Kyle Moore that they found calling him the real Kyle Moore and when we were talking Kyle said that it was it was overwhelming when he woke up and saw like a million notifications he was thinking did did i say something on my podcast and now now they're coming for me but <laughs> regardless he's happy that uh we as the big brother community have welcomed him with open arms and it brought more awareness to his podcast which is so awesome and he says that he will be applying for big brother canada next season so look out for him on the next season we're crossing our fingers so it, it, it has to happen. We have to see him on the next season. That's it. That's it. Period. Uh, but anyway, with all of that being said, you're in for a real treat. Like I said, um, we had a, an amazing discussion as we get into this episode on mental health in media. And we hope you enjoy. You are now listening to The First Ones to Die. The First Ones to Die. First Ones to Die. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the First Ones to Die podcast. We're back at it again. I'm joined by one of our regular hosts, Alex. Alex, how are you doing today? I am good. I just got off work, so a little tired, but still good energy going on. Well, we're glad that you're here, even though you had a long day at work, but that's all that matters. You get to come here and talk with us. Um, Jerome, he's not able to join us today for this episode, but he will be back next week. But in his place, we have a very special guest. He is the host of the Life's a Wreck podcast, which you can listen to now. Um, and for any Big Brother Canada fans out there, he's known as the real Kyle Moore. It is <laughs> Kyle Moore. <laughs> well, one of the reasons why um, I wanted to reach out and have you on the podcast is because you host a podcast on mental health, which is such an awesome outlet to focus, you know, your work on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Life Direct and like some of the issues that you dive into? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I started Life Direct about. Uh, it's approaching two years, so about a year and a half ago now. Um, and basically when I started it, um, I've dealt with mental health issues my entire life. Um, ever since I was like five or six, I can start to recognize in hindsight some of the patterns that still exist within my life today. Um, when I was in university, I was diagnosed with uh, general anxiety disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, GAD and OCD. Um, and, uh, 
and basically it had gotten to a point my mental health had uh just kind of gradually gotten worse throughout my university life uh and, and basically i was like i need to get some things off my chest like i i just kept uh, i didn't talk to anybody in my life about what i was going through um i had this incredible upbringing i didn't really feel like i could um necessarily talk about stuff because like i didn't really have anything to be traditionally upset about i had great parents um who had been together since high school i had a younger sister who was awesome um i was a honor student captain of sports teams drama student like i did a bunch of different stuff and i had this like really idealistic life but yet i was like miserable 24 seven. Um, and so I didn't feel like I had the right to be upset. Uh, I felt like if I was to explain what was going on in my life, that I would be a burden to the people around me. And so I kept it all, uh, kind of packed down inside. And it got to a point in my third year of university where I was like, if I don't tell anybody what's going on, like I'm going to explode. Um, and so I decided that, uh, the best way that I kind of ideated on how I could tell people in my life about what I was going through and uh, I decided that I'm a big believer that like when you put something out into the universe, the right people will find it. Um, and so I created, uh, I created this podcast where I basically wanted just to create something that was essentially like a diary um, that I could just like verbally communicate what I was going through. And then I could put it out into the universe and I could basically tell people, hey, if on your own time you want to learn more about me, you can go and, and listen to the podcast. Um, and then basically it just kind of started to catch a bit of a nerve and I really started to enjoy it. And then I started to reach out to guests and, and friends and that kind of stuff and, and to grow it a little bit. And now it's, uh, yeah, now it's, now it's doing really well and it's something that I, I love to do. So yeah, it's kind of grown since then. I love that. And I've listened yeah. to, um, a bit of it and I, I like how, um, you know, you, you focus on men's mental health, which mm. is very stigmatized, I feel like. And um, also you add your own like personality and, and fun into it. It's not so serious all the time, which mm -hmm. um, I think is good and must be, I'm assuming good for your own mental health to have that outlet as well. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, no, adding that, uh, I always found like when I was looking at mental health content uh, back when I was in university, I like... I did find a lot of it was like really clinical and really stale and, and it just didn't resonate with me as, as like a young man, I was just like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel natural for me to be like listening to or watching. And so I thought when I created the podcast and once it started to kind of become something that I was like, oh, this isn't going to be more than just a diary. This is going to be like a full thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wanted to put a bit of a, I wanted to create something that my younger self could have listened to and would have wanted to listen to. Um, and so, yeah, so I added uh, the idea of like um, kind of like personifying those negative um, thoughts in my head uh, and adding some characters and doing some like uh, soundscapes and skits and trying to make uh trying to make the conversation as like lively and um approachable as possible i love that um Thanks, and we're all about having fun here um uh, today's Absolutely. today's a, a little bit of, of, a, of a more serious episode but one of the reasons why um you know we wanted to have kyle on is because we've been wanting to have um an episode on mental health for a minute now and you know i thought this would be an awesome way to merge our two podcast themes um, as we often talk about, you know, TV and film. So uh, today we're going to be discussing mental health in television, film, and just like media in general. Love it. Um, just a heads up, we will be talking about very serious and sensitive issues um, relating to mental health. So please, please listen at your discretion. Um, so to start off, I was actually reading this study from um, 2019, and it's from USC, USC Annenberg, and it showed that 1.7% of characters in film uh, experienced a mental health condition in contrast to the 18.9% um, of people in the U.S. who experience mm -hmm. a mental health condition. Uh, so basically, just to, to start us off, um, why is that representation so low? I want to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, and it's definitely not something that, uh, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt because it's, uh, it just definitely be a lot of opinion. Um, but I think that the reason that we see that is because we live in a, in a culture that is very, that, that does scrutinize those things pretty closely. Um, and sometimes when you have, when you're going to 
put something that is so intimate to so many people, basically what's going on between your two, between your ears, it doesn't get much more intimate than what's, what's happening in your mind. Um, and you dramatize it for TV and film. Sometimes that can, that can come across as disingenuine um, and that you're trying to basically uh, profit off of the, the things that people are going through. Uh, and I think that sometimes that can be met with a lot of, um, a lot of pushback. I know with movies like uh, with the Joker, for instance, um, that's a really, I mean, I watched a little bit of that movie. I'll be honest. I'm somebody who's really receptive to like horror movies and thrillers and stuff. Uh, and so I remember I kind of had, to, right take a, I had yeah. to take a, yeah, I had to take a little bit of a break from it. Um, so I didn't make it the whole way through, but, um, but when I was watching that, like I'd heard a lot of people talk about it and how it was a really accurate representation. Um, and, and it's one of those things, like a ton of work was put into that, uh, you know, Joaquin Phoenix immersed himself within that, that, role um and that's something but like when it's done in, in a in a casual sense um with a movie that isn't some big block and, and with a not an oscar nominated actor or actress sometimes it can come off in the wrong way and i think a lot of studios are really wary of that because they don't want to be a victim of cancel culture or or you know public outrage kind of thing of people being like hey whoa, whoa, whoa. like how i remember um even recently with uh i believe and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Sia had either directed or produced a film recently, um, and I think it was called Happy, and basically uh, it was about an autistic young girl, and, and people really pushed back on it a lot because they didn't like how autism was portrayed uh, in the movie, and I think that that's one of those things where if a studio with the idea of making money is going to take a shot on a film like this, they got to be really sure that they are going to be met with the right... Um, the uh, I write uh, oh, I mean, I mean, the word it's is not gonna, like, like, gonna have the right approach. Um, yeah, it yeah. was it was yeah, exactly. that she directed it, and it was actually the outrage because when I I actually watched the movie a little bit, and it was kind of annoying. It's the way the people around her handled it. Um, okay. Because there was that scene where the aut autistic girl kind of has a freak out and a panic, and they kind of will grab her with her full body. Absolutely don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um as somebody who has panic attacks it's something not always desired to have physical contact to calm down and also i got i worked in a children's hospital and i got to see some autistic kids and some kids who had other mental mm -hmm. problems sometimes it's that needed space you can't really encroach because they're already feeling enclosed personally mm -hmm. to have it physically out um that's where a lot of that pushback came back for that and like if they had just had some probably some consultation or something on yeah. the set to show how you should pro how it could be properly handled totally. i think it wouldn't have been as controversial as it was being made out to be mm. yeah 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 um and kind of like just along the lines of what you guys are saying like and kyle you were mentioning earlier like basically people are essentially afraid to tackle these issues um and i don't think that necessarily you know, has to be the case as long as you have, you know, people who are qualified and know about different, you know, mental health conditions or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, as long as you aren't coming at it from, you know, a place of malice or a place of even ignorance, as long as you do yeah. the work to, um, to look it's into shutter, these, by the way. These Sorry. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Alex's cat is, has made a cameo appearance, but um, as long as you it. do the work, I think that that people will be receptive of it, and you know, you might, you might not always uh, get the right feedback that you want, but yeah. people might be receptive either way. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree that like I think that um, I I think that there has to be people who are willing to take the chance. And I think that that's the tough thing. It's like, it's like, I feel like a lot of people are probably looking at it around at each other being like, who's going to take the first shot kind of thing. Um, you know, who wants to, who wants to go through the gauntlet so that it can kind of pave the way um, for other people. But like Alex said, like, I think you have, and, and like you said as well, Jonathan, like you have the right consultations, you have the right work that's being put in behind the scenes. Um, I, I think that it's, it's much needed for sure. And I think the other thing too, is like having people portray roles that, like if somebody, you know, is playing somebody with OCD in a movie, it's like, I, I'm somebody who believes that that actor or actress um, should probably be somebody who 
has somewhat of a relationship with OCD uh, or, or anxiety. Like I think that lived experience is such a powerful thing. Um, and uh, it definitely would help with roles like this, bringing that authentic authenticity to it for sure. Yeah. Um, and you can like, and especially not just people who are um, like maybe doctors or who, who are, are educated on mental illness, but like you said, people who have experienced it as well. Yeah. Um, and in uh, this USC Annenberg study um, was really interesting to me uh, because it, it talked about- Yeah, I'm gonna have about, to read the study. Yeah, it was, it, was it, it, it laid it out. It wasn't like a, a you know, regular paper. I probably wouldn't have read it to be honest if it was, <laughs> but it was like a lot of um, like graphs and, and images. And uh, it's really interesting just to break down the statistics but in um, discussing different um, groups represented on screen, um, mainly uh, referring to people of color um, or LGBTQ uh, mm. people of that community, uh, the representation is very low as well. Uh, no characters with a mental health condition were Hispanic out of the people out of the movies that they. Uh, studied were mm -hmm. Hispanic, Latino, Middle Eastern, Af North African, Native oh, American, um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, um, and zero were uh, of the uh, LGBTQ community. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. I that that would be another question for me. Why is why do we think that representation is not there? Yeah. Oh man, that's a. I think that uh, so often I find that uh, Hollywood really makes a point, and this is something that I don't particularly like, is Hollywood really makes a point about, uh, about one cause at a time, uh, where it's like, okay, this, like, it's almost kind of like, hey, look at this movie. We've got, um, we've got three leads. Uh, one of them's a woman. And there we go. We've wiped our hands. That is, that is the focal point of this project. The next time it's like, okay, um, we've got members of the Hispanic and the black communities. Now this is your focal point. But it's like these, you know, when we're, when we're talking about representation in Hollywood, it's like, where's the depth to the, you know, to these characters? Like, that's really, I think, where um, it comes in, where it's just an element of writing. It's just an element of story design. Um, it's just like, okay, how, how can we how can we look at these characters as real people? Because if a, if a cast of characters was a group of regular people, let's say there's 20 people within this cast, five of them would have mental health issues. And so, and that's just a natural thing that would occur within a group of people. And so I think that that's just, I think that that boils down a lot to just kind of like trying to check a box. It, it almost seems like, um, especially within the, the, um, waters that we're in right now where it's like we you know we really trying to give as much representation as we can but i find a lot of the times it's like hey here's that one thing and that's going to be the one thing that we're representing and then the next film it'll be another thing um versus it just being like hey this is a um a, a character who also has this depth to them um and that just makes them human with quotation marks there yeah yeah alex what about you I think I agree with what he's saying that um, movies and shows tend to just pick a box to kind of go ahead and do that. They actually made fun of it. Remember we had discussed earlier in the not another teen movie back from like the early 2000s where they only <laughs> yeah, had yeah. one one black guy there and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm the token guy. You have to yeah. leave the party. Um, so yeah, it's that the lack of representation gets annoying because um, as somebody who I am bipolar, Mm -hmm. and OCD and anxiety have a fun filled basket of all that fun stuff uh it gets kind of annoying to see certain lacks of representation uh it's a lot of women who are tend to be more so than white and it's sad not to see more males experiencing it and honestly even more males uh, like both of yourselves who I now know have more well upbringing um to show that it's the lack of allowing to feel emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the lack of feeling like, oh, this emotion is to be earned or deserved through right. suffering or pain, which is absolutely not true. Um, so I think it forces that on like male characters as well as people of color, where it's like, well, you're not entitled to this emotion that in normal circumstances you would absolutely express. Mm -hmm. um, so 
it takes away from the almost the reality and the truth of a of a movie that could be more powerful and deeper than it could be. So yeah, absolutely. I agree because like if I'm watching something and I continually see a pattern of okay, I'm not seeing the nuance here. I can be a black man with these different mental health conditions. It's, it doesn't always have to be that I'm, I'm absent of, of these just because they don't wanna show them on film. And like we were talking about earlier, um, you know, you just have to have, you have to have those people who want to tackle those issues. Um, and I think that starts with, you know, hiring, that starts with, um, hiring writers who have experienced different mental health um, issues uh, because that's how you're gonna get those stories represented. It's the lack of the research and the writing and just the life experience because often more so than not, they end up getting the same writers because they work with them once and they trust them, but it may not be a good field that they're going into. So you get these writers who are not experienced in mental health or in certain general issues, but they did well in this other story. So it's a lot of networking, but getting looped into the cycle and ending up doing these films like Sia, doing this film that just was a horrible representation of, mm. you know, how to handle an autistic person when they yeah. are having a freak out, just or panic attack, let's put panic it that attack. way. Yeah, 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 no, it's true, I mean, I think that that's, uh, I think you guys both bring up some really interesting points about like, yeah, it, you know, I think it because my, my background is in sport media. Uh, that was my um, degree at uh, Ryerson in Toronto. Um, and so I was surrounded by a lot of different, uh, you know, went to did a lot of media classes and that kind of stuff. And it's uh, it, the, the idea of networking is something that they, they push so hard. And, uh, you know, Alex, when you were just saying that, oh, I've worked with them on the project before, I'm going to bring them back in. It's like, yeah, but they, just because you've worked with them before, it doesn't mean that they're going to be instant able to cater to this new story and a new audience and everything and have that 100 qualified for exactly whatever. for for anything now yeah mm -hmm. yeah which I, have, I feel like happens a lot uh in media and everything you just end up working with the same people and they're like oh yeah if they're the, with this person you're definitely gonna see this actor or see this person but it's like look we already know this is not going to be a very strong role for them you should mm -hmm. probably rethink than going constantly with the same people you know because yeah. I mean you want to help out your friends but at the same time if you really truly want to create a meaningful project you have to be willing to branch out yourself. Yeah the idea of, uh, of recycling actors in Hollywood I find such a funny thing because it's like I understand that you need big names to draw people in obviously at the end of the day it's a business you're trying to make money um but it's like it, to have the same cast you know it, it almost seems like it's this yeah. copy and paste from movie to movie where you've got the same kind of hundred who you always see in the same stuff and it's like i know so many amazing actors and actresses and just individuals in uh in those roles who you're just like wow i think they'd be great for that uh but then obviously it's just like oh but we've also got Timothy Chalamet uh, in the back room. So we gotta, we gotta roll with this guy. Yeah, we gotta uh, bring them out some way. Somehow we have to have them out. Yeah. That's yeah, how exactly. you end up with Scarlett Johansson playing a, an Asian character in Ghost in the Shell. But anyway, that's another mm. story. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another episode. Bad too. Exactly. The movie um, was just bad in general. So I, I think we've basically like covered it, but I, we, we probably answered this already, but our, the media representations that you've seen of um, mental health, are they generally positive or negative? And um, since we've been leaning on a lot of the negative, can you think of any um, positive or accurate portrayals of mental health um, that you've seen at all? Yeah. Um, it's funny, when you, when you were talking about that, a show that just kind of popped into my head um, was Shameless. And, um, I think that Shameless has done a good job and I, and I watched it a while ago and I couldn't tell you the names of the characters or anything, but I feel like they've done a really good job with that, that depth, that nuance uh, that we were talking about earlier, where characters have these like multiple levels to them. Um, you know, we, we see really accurate representations of addiction. Um, I remember a scene that really sticks out in my head um, was, um, 
when uh, Fiona was getting married and uh, her, her husband or her, her dad basically came in with a, with a bag of speed and this guy who sounded like he was just this dream guy turns out to be an addict or he had been an addict, had pretended to get clean, had lied to the people around him and was still using on the side. And, um, and just like, I remember watching that, that whole um, season and I was like, wow, like that's it, the way that they showed how he kind of manipulated the facts and how he kind of lied to himself and how he was caught up in, uh, in how mental health was affecting his addiction. Like it was, it was really well done. Um, and I remember even back then, and I wasn't as involved with the mental health world. Um, I was really impressed with how they went about that. And that's just one example from that show. There's a bunch of different ones um, with how they deal with uh, anxiety. Um, it's, it's just really, I, I think Shameless did a really good job. Um, God, I'm really trying to think of some movies that uh, that i've seen recently again i'm a i'm such a i'm such a happy-go-lucky movie person like i watch like like old like 90s and 80s movies and that kind of stuff um i'm not a, i don't really kind of hop into like um psycho thrillers and that kind of stuff uh which is where you see a lot of a lot of that that representation of mental health is in like slasher flicks and that kind of stuff so i guess it's in okay. that sense yeah, it would be a little bit the, more negative the guys really don't either it's me i'm a very much a horror film gore okay. psychopaths all my favorite things mm -hmm, got you <laughs> that yes. seems to be a, that seems to be a favor towards women gotta love those crime yeah. shows <laughs> fair enough that, that fair SNL enough. sketch that i was that i was um telling you about i don't know if you watched it yet but i did uh i will say i won't watch a crime show unless there's a minimum of six victims so that was kind of on a little too on point <laughs> okay <laughs> little, i don't feel like that's a real yeah i don't feel like it's a real solo killer until uh so there's a six victim, which hmm, I think is very know. grim. Yeah, that's a little bit. <laughs> good to know, good to know. <laughs> that was a little bit. What about um, Inside and Out, I thought was a great representation of, like, uh, a way the, depression the and anxiety can, yeah. Hmm. The way uh, depression and anxiety can work in you and not figuring out how to feel about emotions or even express them because um, the girl, I forget her name because it's been quite some time, didn't Sue know. Riley, I think. Yes. I uh, didn't know how to express herself to her parents and talk about how the move and everything had affected her so much. Mm -hmm. And she just wanted to appear happy for her family. And there's that internal struggle again uh, yeah, with, with family. Yeah. Of like, well, you're doing so much for me. I'm trying not to be sad for you. But at the same yeah. time, she was a child. Her whole life was just uprooted. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, it kind of showed that it may appear small to others, but it, it's a real pain inside and it should be expressed. And how the multitude of emotions kind of work with each other because you can't have happy without being sad mm -hmm. because you can't have happy, you can't feel either without feeling one. Mm -hmm. I think well uh, it just while you, while you were talking about that, when you said Pixar and then uh, I, I thought of Inside Out and then I went to Soul, I, I thought of Soul, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, oh, I haven't and then, watched that. And then I went to, and then I went to Disney Plus and then I went to Marvel uh, and thinking about, yeah, that was kind of like the, the stream of consciousness. Um, but I thought about, um, I thought about the Iron Man, um, the Iron Man experience with PTSD. And I thought that, you know what, the, the how they display the panic attacks in Marvel, um, I, I thought they actually did a really good job. I, I, re I resonated a lot when I saw, I remember the scene with, um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, and Don Cheadle in the in the bar, and the kids come up to them and and they're like, "Hey, can you sign this? Can you sign this?" And the kids like asking him questions, and it kind of just like there's almost just like this energy in the air, and it's this like vibration kind of thing, and you can hear like his thoughts getting faster and faster, and and uh, the kid is like kind of more pushing things into his face, and he's kind of feeling more claustrophobic, and then he has to he has to remove himself from the situation, and I resonate with that a lot because when I have panic attacks, very much it is that silence kind of sitting there. It's not like the, the big thing. It's like that silence, 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 getting deeper and deeper and deeper into, into anxiety until the point where it's like, I need a new environment or I'm going to explode. Uh, and so leaving and going to, going to realistically what he would consider a safe space in his Iron Man suit versus, you know what I mean? Like that, that I thought was portrayed really well. Um, so that's another example that kind of popped into my head while you were, uh, while you were talking. I haven't seen Inside Out either, though, so I think I have to, I think I might have Inside to give it a watch. Is, it's a very good film. It's very sad. No, for, fair. But then it's all the, I feel like all the animation movies that days are yeah, just true. super, yeah. like, sad. They hit you in a spot They're that, trying like, to make them sadder and sadder. I'm um, sure they are. With every movie. 
It's true. Um, I just remember the old Toy Story movies and how they got sadder and sadder. Don't even get me started. I didn't I know. cry. I did not cry during the Toy Story movies, and my sister got mad at me for that. Apparently, <laughs> uh, uh, apparently Siri. Siri, yeah. Apparently, Siri really wants to watch the Toy Story movies. See? I heard her talking. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's. that's it was uh, yeah, Toy yeah. Story 3 where everybody cried the most, right? When they were in the furnace? Yeah. Yes, because they, they were, were all like holding hands. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. all oh. That was. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was too much. Disney. Yeah, it was like it, it's like it's the it's the end of the road or whatever between. Uh, uh, they're all going out together oh, though. Oh lord! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Well, for for mine, I was I was thinking about the negative. I'll start with the negative since we've been we've been on positive. So I'll start on the negative and then get to the positive so I can end on the positive. Um. But I was I so I watched the entire um, Prince Harry and Meghan interview that was this Mm. past Sunday I believe and in one of the um, portions of the interview Megan talks about how she was actually suicidal at one point and she was she was prepared to essentially take her life and the uh, monarchy didn't do anything about it really and when that interview came out I saw a lot of people a, a, a few people, a, a good handful of people who were like, oh, she's just trying to get attention or she's making this up or this is all for publicity. And the fact that regardless of how, because I know the, the royals, they, they bring a lot of controversy and a lot of people have, have mixed feelings about them. But the fact that people could be compelled to say that you're faking it or or you're just doing this for attention. I think that's how the issue, you know, spirals out of control for a lot of Mm. people. And so that was something that, that just, it it really got to me and um, made me upset when I would, when I looked online after the interview and saw some of those reactions, it was just, I I didn't like that. And it's not TV or movies per se, but it's, it's, it's media. So. Mm. Yeah. There's definitely, there's definitely such a, uh, and this is something I've been really fortunate to look at through, uh, through the podcast is this kind of like dehumanization once somebody amasses a following or wealth or anything like that, where it's like on people have the idea that, okay, once you hit a certain level of success, all of your issues go away, but like the pressure and stuff that I can imagine comes with marrying into the royal family as the first uh, as a black woman as like as a just as an american like there's so many different elements here um somebody not of noble birth somebody who i believe was raised by a single mother if i'm not mistaken um so like there are so many things that are stacked against her as she's embarking on this relationship with the monarchy of england um and like that's stressful (laughs) like just because you have access to the the queen's credit card doesn't mean that all of a sudden all of that pressure goes away um and and for people to uh for people not to have that empathy um for people in that for for somebody in those situations i think is interesting like i've talked with professional football players um tiktok stars and those you know people who have a lot of media attention on them through my podcast and and it's they all kind of say the same thing where they assumed that they would get over some of their mental hurdles once they reached a certain level that they were happy with. Um, but then certain, certain things in their life, almost like there was, there was increased pressure. There was increased, okay, what do I do with my money? Who can I trust? What, you know, who can I talk to? Can I, is it good for my image if I talk about my mental health? Um, there's so many other things that now become a part of your life where it's just, it's so, it's kind of shitty that that's how people react is just being like, oh, just because they have a better life than, or uh, an, on the outside, a more glamorous life than, than I do, that instantly that means that they can't have the same issues that I would have. It's like, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all human. And I think that uh, anybody can, can have these struggles, doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. 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 You don't, you don't want to try to reach a goal that is unattainable um, pertaining your own health you, you you shouldn't go um with the theory that oh if i reach this amount of success then all my problems will go away because right. regardless of where you are you're gonna have problems so um and for the positive for my positive example yes um <laughs> even though it's you might not necessarily think it's like a positive example because it, it is very dark and explicit but uh euphoria um so i 
Jerome, I still haven't seen the special episode, so please get off my back. But uh, I have seen the first season of Euphoria, and um, not only did I enjoy it, it was entertaining, but it brought literally every issue in the book that you could think of, um, because it has, you know, an ensemble cast of characters, and everyone has their own, you know, faults and, and truths, and uh, I think Zendaya does a really good job, even though um, I think I've heard her in interviews saying that she doesn't personally have experience with uh, some of the mental uh, illnesses that her character deals with. Uh, she has, you know, done the work, done the research, and you can tell, and she portrays it in a very truthful and, and real way, and in a way that doesn't seem like it's it's uh, disregarding or or uh, making fun of or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Any any mental health struggles. So that's my that's my positive example. I, I keep hearing about Euphoria. That's another show that I haven't watched, but I think I'd be. It's very like I've heard that if you like Shameless, that you'll like Euphoria because it's kind of that real world. You know, maybe a little bit played up or whatever, but it's still that kind of like real world um, experiences. So I think I might have to check it out. Yeah, and I know that they've like actually cast, some of the people that they cast are like not actors. Um, wow. They're, they're, they they act in the show, but they didn't cast that. When they cast them, they weren't an actor. They want real people and, and real stories, which I think is really cool and unique, which hmm. makes it feel more real as well. That's interesting. I, how, would, how would that work? I mean, I, I think that there's such a, there's such a, pre, like, power for an on-screen presence and and there's like some people are trained for that so I'm curious like how that would work yeah it's really interesting because I know the guy who plays Fez her drug dealer he got stopped on the side of the street and by a casting director saying hey would you audition for this show and he got the role and wow. he didn't act a, a day in his life before that which I wonder if he was like insulted did you guys look like a drug dealer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, why did we you saw you on the there? street. We saw you on the street. We thought drug dealer. First thing, will you come in and uh, and work with us? I mean, that's kind of I mean, it's it, like either you go with and you're like, yeah, sure, or like you get yeah. really fine. He went with it, and now he's on a really you know well written show. So yeah, exactly. Explore all your options. I think the really good thing about Euphoria and Shameless is that they show. A great deal about how if mental health is left untreated or mm. not acknowledged how easily you can slip into self-medicating with drugs and alcohol and other self-destructive behavior and I think a lot of people think um, that it's kind of almost the reverse you become the alcoholic then you get depressed and you know then your life goes to ruins but really it's kind of another way when mm. you're not acknowledging the issues at hand or that you're facing um, not able to get the help or not willing. Some people, you know, again, don't want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of do the self-destructive behavior that can lead to things like euphoria or shameless, where all of a sudden you're kind of using manipulation for the people around you, the people you love, or, you know, you're just doing all these kind of things that can hurt so many people and not just yourself eventually. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think put, those are great. Sure. Yeah. Those are great examples of like the turns mental health can take with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and getting uh, towards the end here, um, has has anything you've seen, whether it be in media or TV, film, whatever, has that changed your view of mental health or your own mental health itself or, or anything like that? Hmm. Um, I think that... Uh... I definitely think it kind of helped with, like, I, I remember back watching, uh, I don't know if it was Iron Man 3 or whatever the, I remember that I was talking about before, because I'm a big Marvel fan, love my, love my superheroes. Um, and so I remember when I was, at, <laughs> I know, oh, okay. yeah, I was like, hey, <laughs> that's, that sucks, that sucks. Yeah. yeah, love, love me some Marvel. Um, and so, uh, and so I remember when I watched that for the first time, and I, I think it's Iron Man 3, um, that I, I remember watching it and I was like, and I was like, 
I do that. Like that, that thing in the bar, like I've done that before. I've left, I've left movie theaters because I've gotten overwhelmed and I've had panic attacks and I've, I've walked out. Uh, I've left bars and restaurants because I've been like, had a panic attack, walked out. And so I was like, I get that. I get that. And so I think that like, even if I wasn't really necessarily aware of it at the time, I think subliminally it kind of gave, gave me a little bit of that permission where you kind of see that representation on, on screen and you're like, wow, like this is somebody who, uh, you know, the uh, Robert Downey Jr. who has had his own struggles with mental health throughout his life, um, portrayed that really well. And, and it kind of did, it gave, it gave me that little bit of like, oh, okay, maybe there's like a, maybe there's like a name for this kind of stuff. Like maybe like, this is like something that I, I actually like, it's not just me. I think that was the biggest thing is this idea of like, it's not just me. Cause I didn't have anybody, anybody in my friend group who talked about mental health or panic attacks or anything like that. Um, didn't really talk about it in my family or my school or anything like that in my community. So when I saw, um, this superhero, uh, that I like looked up to when I saw he experienced this kind of stuff, I was like, Oh, okay. It's not just me. I, I get that. I get that. So even if it wasn't necessarily blatantly obvious at the time, I think it did give me a little bit of that permission to be like, okay, maybe I can start talking about this a little bit. Maybe I can get some things off my chest. Um, I'd say that that's the example that pops into my head uh, first and foremost, but I certainly do hope that we start to see um, more stories with characters that just have like real world mental health issues. Um, you know, things that just affect them once in a while, uh, not something that is like their defining character um, detail kind of thing, but just something that like comes in and out of their life as, as they get more stressed uh, in a situation that the mental health starts to play a bigger role, like that ebbs and flows the very natural um, flow of mental health. I would like to see a lot more because I think that like, you know, I, I would definitely want kids to have that same reaction where like they see these characters that they look up to and they're like, wow, all right, maybe I can go and talk to somebody or maybe I can tell somebody what I'm going through or that maybe I resonate with what I just saw. Um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd love to see that more for sure. And um, that actually ties into your most recent episode, the Mythbusters about a therapy edition. So I got to listen yeah, to it. Yeah. It, was, it was very nice. And thank you. Um, I have a, uh, we have a friend uh, who just began going to therapy and she's working through some stuff. And anytime she talks to me about it, I'm just, I try to, my best to be encouraging. Mm -hmm. Not too much though, um, because I'm so excited that she's, now willing to move forward into that step and absolutely uh, yeah knowing that yeah. It, it's no longer a stigma for her and i've seen like in movies and films it's it's nice to know that there's is a step forward for that yeah yeah that's great and and you know good good for your friend because i know that that's a definitely a tough st step to take for a lot of people um to get to that point where it's like okay you know what I definitely know within my own life that I had this sense of like, if I went to somebody, it would be, it would mean that I couldn't handle my own shit and that it would be like a failure, kind of like a, a scorch on my character. Um, but I'm a much better person because of the fact that I went to therapy and it helped me tr tremendously. So um, that's great to see. And yeah, I know for, for so long that uh, it was one of those things where you'd see people on the big screen and the small screen when they'd go to therapy and they wouldn't tell their family about it. Or they'd slink around and they, they were going to therapy just kind of like yeah. behind secretly. And, and I hope that uh, that's something that, you know, with like, you know, the guys that I had on my podcast talking about how the fact that there's just these two young guys who just love what they do and they love to, to be able to help people with their, their suffering, um, that those kind of people are the people who are in positions of uh, uh, therapy and psychiatry um, and that we see more of that in, in movies and TV as well. Yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I 100% I agree. I think um, representation is... Super critical um, mm. in all aspects, you know, multifaceted. Let's have, you know, those, you know, Black, Asian, Latinx, um, everyone uh, who has experience with different mental health um, issues. Uh, let's, let's bring them to the table. And um, I've also learned that, you know, at, as society grows, we become more uh knowledgeable essentially like one of my favorite movies is psycho and i can i can understand that like looking back at it like it might not be the most you know uh accurate representation of someone who who might have that that illness but uh i think we should take those as learning opportunities to 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 grow and and develop new media 
um, in in this new era where you know we sh we should have have known about all of this stuff in the past, but right now we're trying to correct and right those wrongs. Mm. But I think that's that's super important. I know I know you uh, that we're we're getting to the end here, but I really wanted to hop on that point that you just said of uh, of new era, new media, because I think that that's something where a lot of the times, and this is something that. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, a lot of people go back and we kind of like, we take characters from the past and we really kind of try to look at them through today's lens uh, and scrutinize them in very um, specific ways catered to society and culture now. But I think the idea that like we are in a new age, it's like, let's tell some new stories. Let's not necessarily as much uh, say like, you know, for instance, be like, uh, okay, now this character from from way forever ago, uh, now we're just, just for the sake of almost like, it almost feels inauthentic and like, hopping on a trend to be like, by the way, this whole time, they've actually been part of the LGBTQ plus community. And you're like, and you're like, really? Like, wait a minute, you didn't say that for 20 years. And now all of a sudden you're saying way back then versus yeah. being like, hey, we've now developed this new story, this new character that, that is, you know, that, that is kind of like, that is a, an element of their persona. Um, it, it's just, yeah, that, that idea of new era, new stories, new media. I think that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree with all that. And just the change we're seeing, uh, just hopefully they can just do it a little bit better. <laughs> it's yeah, nice to yeah, see a little more yeah. representation, but let's do more correct representation. Mm, absolutely. I can say that. Yeah. Exactly. But. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I know you mentioned us, us wrapping up. We go over time. We always say like fair, we're gonna be time, but we, we go over every single time, sometimes like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I know sometimes as a podcaster, you're like, you're like, you're trying to hit a kind of a certain time quote. So it can get, uh, you're like, all right, we're going to wrap up. And then you have a guest who launches into a story and you're like, okay, yeah, let's, let's, you know, let's kind of get it going. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Exactly. Um, well, with that being said, um, I want to thank you so much, Kyle, for coming yeah, thank on you guys. and talking with us. Um yeah uh what i guess what can we can we expect anything um soon with life is a wreck life's a, i almost said life is a wreck life it's a wreck. okay it's, it's a, both. a little abbreviation it's both, it's both. <laughs> technically speaking it's both yeah. um yeah so uh so just kind of continuing working on the podcast um i've got uh, i've got a really incredible podcast coming up this weekend um, with a critically acclaimed podcaster from uh, Ireland named Bobby Temps. He's the host of Mental, which is one of the first podcasts I ever listened to along my mental health journey. So it was really cool to have him on. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we had a really great conversation about uh, masculinity, eating disorders, um, just a lot of really interesting broad topics, which was great. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I just, uh, I love to connect with new people. Um, so I, I would definitely always encourage, uh, if anybody wants to reach out, tell me, I, I always love to hear other people's stories and experiences. It's something that, uh, brings me a lot of joy. So, um, my, my Instagrams, if you guys, I, I don't know if you guys, uh, are okay with me kind of just like throwing those out no, there. Go for it. Okay, anyway. perfect. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, like the podcast Instagram is at Life's Rec Podcast. My own Instagram, if you're more comfortable messaging me on there, is at Morzy. That's M O O R Z Y Y Y. Um, and uh, and I'm always down to talk and uh, learn more about uh, people's experiences. So I would encourage I would encourage people to uh, to do so if they feel comfortable. And yeah, thank you guys for having me on. This has been uh, this has been a lot of fun. Really great conversation. So great way to end my night for sure. Yeah, no, for thanks sure. for coming. We really appreciate you making time for us. Of course. I really yeah. enjoyed this. Yes. Um, Alex, where can people find you at? People can find me at my, which kind of now after these topics makes it kind of sound sad, my Instagram <laughs> username is Alex and nobody. <laughs> you can find me there. I love that. Uh, That's great. <laughs> uh, I'm very active on our Instagram as well as the first ones to die podcast, that Instagram. And I also mess around with our TikTok a lot. Nice. Uh, what about you, Jonathan? Where can we find you? Yes, you can find me at Jonathan Keys. Like Alex said, feel free to um, chat with us. Uh, hit us up on email, first ones today at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see you all next week. We'll be back with Jerome. Once again, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, and take care, everyone. Good stuff, guys. Yeah. Yeah.